This Week at NASA. Space Exploration Technologies, or SpaceX, will launch its Dragon spacecraft on its second Commercial Orbital Transportation Services demonstration flight on February 7, 2012. Pending completion of its final safety reviews, testing, and verification, SpaceX might also send Dragon to rendezvous with the International Space Station. The announcement was made by NASA Deputy Administrator Lori Garver. So it is the opening of that new commercial uh, cargo delivery era for ISS, and it's uh, great news for NASA and SpaceX together. Three, two, one, zero. We have liftoff of the Falcon 9. On its first demonstration flight a year ago, Dragon was launched from the Kennedy Space Center, then splashed down in the Pacific after successfully completing two orbits of Earth. Thank you very much. Garver made the SpaceX announcement during her opening remarks to NASA's Future Forum at the Museum of Flight in Seattle. Since 2008, Future Forums have brought together technologists, scientists, and engineers with local business, science, technology, and education leaders to discuss the importance of innovation, discovery, commercial partnerships, and education to the success of America's space program and the nation as a whole. Together, we're truly developing an industry that until recently had been largely science fiction, but now it stands poised to open the new frontier, that next chapter in human space development. At a press conference held at NASA Ames Research Center, the Kepler team announced the discovery of its first confirmed planet in the habitable zone, or the region around a star where liquid water could exist on a planet's surface. Named Kepler 22b, the planet is about 2.4 times the radius of the Earth and orbits a sun-like star about 600 light years away between the constellations of Cygnus and Lyra. Well, certainly the thing that's most exciting to me is the fact that we have finally, after looking at all these candidates, spending all this effort, that we could confirm a planet in a habitable zone that's nearly Earth's size. Scientists don't know yet if Kepler-22b has a predominantly rocky, gaseous, or liquid composition, but its discovery is a step closer to finding Earth-like planets. The Kepler team announced today 1,094 new planet candidates, bringing the total roster up to 2,326. Of those, 207 are Earth size. It's an exciting milestone because we are really honing in on, on truly Earth-sized habitable planets. The announcement helped to kick off the beginning of the first ever Kepler Science Conference. Just days earlier, the Kepler mission celebrated 1,000 days of conducting science operations in space. Famed astrophysicist and science communicator Neil deGrasse Tyson also came to the event to help the team celebrate the milestone. It's great to see the energy and enthusiasm of the workforce for Kepler matching the magnitude of the science that's coming out from the telescope itself. Kepler is NASA's three and a half year mission to search for Earth-sized, potentially habitable planets in our galaxy. Just up the highway from Ames in San Francisco, the announcement of another exciting finding at the American Geophysical Union's annual meeting. Researchers from NASA and The Ohio State University confirmed that the major tsunami caused by the March 2011 Tohoku Oki earthquake in Japan was in fact a merging tsunami caused by two wave fronts. The forming of a single double high wave increased its intensity and ability to travel long distances without losing power. The odds against the NASA and European radar satellites observing and capturing the data they did of this merging tsunami are said to be 10 million to one. More than 34 years after its launch, NASA's Voyager 1 spacecraft has entered a new region between our solar system and interstellar space. Data it's obtained over the last year suggests this new region is a kind of cosmic purgatory. Where the solar wind is calm, our solar system's magnetic field piles up and higher energy particles appear to leak from our solar system into interstellar space. Although Voyager 1 is about 11 billion miles from the sun, it has yet to cross one major space-bearing threshold. We're very close to the edge of interstellar space now. Unfortunately, our models are not accurate enough to tell us how close, so it could be a few more months or it could be a few more years. 
But Voyager 1 is moving out a billion miles every three years, so we shouldn't have too long to wait to find out what's outside. Expedition 30 Soyuz Commander Oleg Kononenko, NASA Flight Engineer Don Pettit, and European Space Agency Flight Engineer Andrei Kalpers have left the Gagarin Training Center in Star City, Russia for the Baikonur Cosmodrome in Kazakhstan, where they'll complete training for their launch to the International Space Station later this month. Liftoff is slated for December 21st. Astronaut Chris Ferguson, the last person to serve as commander of a space shuttle mission, has retired from NASA. He plans to take a new job in the private sector. And lift off, the final lift off of Atlantis on the shoulders of the space shuttle, America will continue the dream. On STS-135 in July 2011, the retired U.S. Navy captain was the commander for the final flight of Space Shuttle Atlantis, the 135th and final mission of America's 30-year space shuttle program. A milestone for engineers in the J2X program at the Stennis Space Center. They recently installed the upgraded J2X power pack on the A1 test stand and are a step closer to starting new tests. The power pack is a critical component of the J2X, the engine that'll produce the 294,000 pounds of thrust needed for NASA's new space launch system to carry astronauts to destinations beyond low Earth orbit. The Microgravity Science Glovebox team has reason to celebrate. The science facility aboard the International Space Station has passed 10,000 hours of operation. The glove box, developed by the European Space Agency and managed by the Marshall Space Flight Center, launched to the station during Expedition 5 in 2002. Over the past nine years, the glove box has been used to conduct a wide range of microgravity research, including fluid physics, combustion science, material science, biotechnology, fundamental physics, and other investigations seeking to understand the role of gravity in basic physical and chemical interactions. The big thing about MSG is containment, so it allows us to do all these different types of experiments that may have some impact to crew safety or, or the crew's health or whatever, and they're able to do it in a confined environment. So that gives, that gives the experimenters on Earth a chance to do something in space and use the microgravity environment to do it to get results that they couldn't get on Earth. The Hubble Space Telescope has passed another milestone in its 21 years of exploration, the 10,000th refereed science paper based on data captured by Hubble has been published. This makes the telescope one of the most prolific astronomical endeavors in history. For the past 21 years, thousands of astronomers around the world in over 35 countries have engaged in Hubble research. 300 teenagers spent their Saturday night getting connected during TEDx Youth at NASA. The event, sponsored by NASA Langley, the National Institute of Aerospace, and Virginia Air and Space Center, offered 13 to 18-year-olds an evening of motivating speakers, interactive exhibits, and messages about creativity, risk-taking, and becoming a leader. It's not about who never makes mistakes. It's not about who never falls down. It's about who builds the skill of getting up faster in today's world to really be a superstar. At TEDx Youth at NASA, the goal was to get liberal arts-minded students thinking about how they can play a role in the areas of science, technology, engineering, and math. I really like the speakers. Um, they, they're very inspirational, and I liked Simon Nance, I believe his name was. He kind of put calculus into life and kind of explained a couple things that like didn't really occur to me, so that was interesting. We've got some really tough problems in this world that we need you to solve and they require an understanding of science, technology, engineering, and mathematics, and that's what this conference is about, getting you excited, getting you motivated about those subjects. NASA Administrator Charlie Bolden and Deputy Administrator Lori Garver were on hand at the 2011 Combined Federal Campaign Carnival and Silent Auction at NASA headquarters. I think I'll take red. CFC, the world's largest and most successful annual workplace charity campaign, raises millions of dollars every year to support community organizations and provide aid to survivors of natural disasters. The Combined Federal Campaign is here to support uh, families and folks in need 
and we at here at NASA headquarters are hoping to raise $300,000 towards that goal. And that's This Week at NASA. For more on these and other stories, log on to www.nasa.gov.